Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's class. Um, we will be continuing from where we left yesterday. Uh, so yesterday, we just touched upon some of the basic information that will be required in proceeding with uh, the design examples we are targeting. So uh, the last discussion was towards uh, developing high gain amplifier. We uh, discussed two topologies, two schemes, either using cascode in a single stage amplifier, making it high impedance output, and hence getting a large gain at the output of the amplifier. And the second option that we were uh, we also briefly discussed was having a multi-stage amplifier, where suppose you are having two common source amplifiers cascaded together, each of them giving you GMRO gain. So overall, you can get GMRO whole square gain by the combination of two stages. Um, so let us see how uh, uh, we can apply the same scheme in differential amplifier and finally develop a two-stage op-amp, uh, which will be uh, used as a low noise amplifying front end for our design. Now, uh, we have briefly, very briefly touched upon the concept of differential amplifier. Um, uh, so, although most of you will be aware of the basic operation principle, we'll be just, uh, as we describe the design details, I'll be just touching upon the uh, basic information as well. So, we will be using, making use of two topologies of diffamps. So, the first topology that we discussed yesterday, current source load. So, this is called a current source load. The reason that it is acting like a current source, it is providing some bias current, I bias by 2. So, both these PMOS transistor act like current sources and also you have a biasing transistor which is total, uh, which is thinking a total current of I B. Uh, and the other topology that you may have uh, come across in our discussion yesterday is uh, diffamp with current mirror load. So, this is another uh, topology where you have a current mirror load, you have V plus, V minus and you have a single unit output V out. Whereas in the first case, you have V out plus and V out minus. So, the input as well as output is differential in the first case. Whereas in the second case, input can be differential, the output is single ended. So, uh, we can make use of both these transistors and develop uh, multi stage or two stage uh, amplifier required for the op amp design. Uh, we have seen what is the uh, what is the ad advantage, uh, what, are the, what are the disadvantages with respect to uh, the active load conditions. So, in this case, we do not have a well defined DC point. So, we discussed how to obtain a desired DC point at the output. So remember, in order to operate the ampli operate this circuit as a, a nice amplifier, we need a fixed appropriate DC bias point at the output and we uh, applied common mode feedback to set it. In the other case, however, we do not require a common mode feedback because here our output DC voltage or we can say the common mode output voltage is set by this diode connected transistor. So, that is the advantage of this diode connected load. So, if you are having a bias current I B, each of this getting divided between the two transistors say I B by 2, I B by 2 each. So, whenever we have this diode connected transistor, and we are enforcing certain current into it, say in this case I B by 2. So, so, it is going to develop an appropriate V G S to support that I B by 2. So, the purpose of the diode connected MOSFET happens to be establishment of an appropriate V G S value for a corresponding bias current. And if you do not have any differential input applied, that means both the input at, at the same DC level, under those conditions, both the outputs also according to the symmetry of the circuit will be at the same DC condition. So, this is upper branch just acts like a current mirror, whatever current flows into the uh, left side MOSFET, the same current gets mirrored into the right side. And if these two circuits are perfectly matched and the DC condition, there is no AC signal, only common mode biasing condition is applied at both the inputs or say a common mode signal is applied to both the inputs, which is varying in the same manner for both the transistors, the output will remain. Uh, uh, 
close together. Both these outputs will be remaining uh, same. So in that case, what I can say is the DC bias point over here at the output is determined by the diode connected MOSFET, the VSG of the diode connected MOSFET. And we don't need a specific common mode uh, feedback to control the DC point. So now another uh, important issue that we have uh, been discussing uh, yesterday is common mode rejection ratio. Uh, we briefly discussed the power supply rejection ratio, its impact on the, the resolution of the data that we are trying to record, how can it corrupt the uh, resolution and uh, uh, pollute our signal. Likewise, we also briefly discussed the significance of common mode rejection. A differential amplifier, uh, an ideal differential amplifier should be able to reject the uh, common mode disturbance fully. So uh, in the second case, this particular uh, amplifier, we are taking the output single-endedly. And we have a current source transistor. Now, what, uh, what can we expect about the uh, common mode gain in these two cases? So if you are tying both the inputs together, in the second case, as well as in the first case, and changing that input together, so that means we are applying a common mode input. So which of these two cases, we are going to observe larger signal at the output. Suppose we tied both the inputs together and applying a common mode signal. As a result, we expect some fluctuation, maybe uh, very small, but we expect some fluctuation at the output. In the first case, we have two outputs. Second case, only one output. In the second case, there is going to be some minute fluctuation, even though it's going to be very small. And the reason why it is going to be small is that if you just look at the operation, if both the voltages are going up slightly, if this current is increasing by a small amount delta i, it will also be increasing by the same amount delta i. This delta i going to the P MOSFET will be mirrored by the upper end MOSFET. So you are having the same delta i being sung by the N MOSFET and same delta i being provided by the P MOSFET. So if I look at the load over here, suppose you are having an equivalent load capacitance over here, so you don't, you get a very small or negligible small signal current flowing out. So basically this mirroring operation tries to cancel the common mode signal going to the output. And hence this circuit can achieve very good common mode rejection ratio. In this case, the common mode gain can be significant from one of these input to the outputs. The two outputs will still have some fluctuation. So if you are having an input signal which is changing, we once again expect that there is going to be some you know, common mode fluctuation at both the outputs. And we can uh, quickly evaluate the effect as well. So how do we uh, uh, simulate the common mode circuit? So for the common mode, we can just merge these two branches together because both the drains as well as uh, the gates are tied together. So I can just make the common mode half circuit, the input being applied over here. This is the bias transistor, and here is the output. So this is uh, this becomes 2M1. If this is M1, it becomes 2M1. If this is uh, M2, it becomes 2M2. And this is the bias transistor M3. So this is the common mode half circuit. This is the bias voltage. This is also the bias voltage, and we are applying a signal at the common mode signal at the gate of the M1 tied together. So what is the output signal over here? What is the gain under this condition from the input of this gate to the output? The small signal. So this is something equivalent to having a common source transistor with certain load, as well as some source impedance. So we have ZD and we have ZS, and we are applying an input signal, VCM. What should be the V out? So once again, if we have a common source without any source impedance, source is grounded, then we know what is the output. GM times ZD times VCM, that will be the output, right? For a common source amplifier, GM ZD gives the output. If you have ZS, then what is the common mode? What is the output signal? If you remember, GM ZD upon 1 plus GM ZS minus times v VCM. So this is the 
way we can compute the common mode output. And if uh, GM ZS is much, much greater than one, then we can ignore this one and we have around ZD upon ZS as the common mode gain. So in the first case, what is the common mode gain? If, if I want to find out the common mode gain for this circuit, what is it? ZD is RO. I'm just writing the order. It will be basically RO by two. So I'm just writing the order. So ZD in the first case is RO. And what is ZS? So we can write down GM RO upon one plus GM ZS. So in this case, what is the ZS? If I uh, want to find out ZS, what is ZS in this case? RO, RO of the MOSFET, once again. So you are having GM RO on one plus GM RO. So once again, if it is uh, very large, we can just uh, ignore this and you are getting around one. So we do have a common mode gain. So if you are having uh, a common mode signal applied, we do get a significant common mode gain in this case. It is not very, very small. It is not really negligible. In the second case, uh, how do we find out the common mode gain? Once again, we can follow the same principle. We can tie these two nodes together. So in this case, what is the half circuit? Now in this circuit, if we tie these two nodes together, we see that the load transistor will die out connected. So the gate and drain will be shorted together. And then we have the input device, which is receiving the signal, and then once again, the source. So here, we have a load, which is diode connected. What is the equivalent impedance? If I want to, again, replace this circuit, you have an input signal at the gate of this device. At the source, you are once again having an impedance RO. At the drain, also, you have an impedance given by impedance of this MOSFET looking upward. What is that impedance? Sorry? 1 upon GM. And how we can see that? So if this is just a diode connected device. And if we apply a small voltage over here, the same voltage goes to the gate. And therefore, it is just going to give us a GM VGS small signal current. Therefore, the impedance is 1 upon GM, right? So looking upward into the diode connected transistor, the impedance is 1 upon GM. So whenever we have a diode connected device, it gives us relatively low impedance looking into the diode connection. So it becomes a low impedance node. So we have an overall impedance looking upward approximately 1 upon GM. And therefore, once again, I can write down the overall gain in this case, GM RD, which is 1 upon GM upon 1 plus GM RO. Right? So see, we can get a huge suppression, GM R O, 1 upon GM R O. So this means that the common mode uh, gain in this circuit is going to be much smaller. GM R O can be pretty large, 10, definitely greater than 10, it can be 50 to 100 for intrinsic uh, uh, gain for the MOSFET. And as a result, what we can see is the single side is definitely going to have much smaller common mode uh, gain as compared to the uh, single-sided signal of the first case. However, if we take the signal differentially, in this case, despite having significantly larger common mode gain for each of these branches, these two common mode gains are going to be same. And as a result, if I take the signal differentially from the first case, it is going to give us high common mode rejection ratio. So the, so the single-ended common mode gain for this circuit is larger. But because it is allowing us completely differential output, we can subtract that common mode coming at both the outputs, and hence we get a large common mode rejection ratio. We can completely reject the uh, common mode signal coming at both the drains, and hence we can achieve ideally infinite common mode rejection ratio, because common mode gain becomes zero. If the sites are two transistors are fully matched and we are getting perfect uh, division of the small signal between these two branches, we can get perfect, uh, perfectly same common mode signal coming here because of the applied common mode signal at the input and hence CMRR of infinity. But of course, in real circuits, we are going to have mismatches. So if uh, the VT of uh, the transistors and W by L can have some random mismatches, VT plus delta VT, where delta VT can be having some Gaussian distribution. 
So for example, if I talk about 180 nanometer CMOS technology, delta VT uh, for a nominal VT of 350 millivolt, we can get a delta VT, sigma of the delta VT can be around as bad as 50 millivolt. So minimum size transistors can have delta VT of up to 50 millivolt. If you increase the area of the device, it goes down by uh, square root of the area. So, but still, if you are having mismatch between transistor sizes and the threshold voltage, which is inevitable, once again, you will have common mode signal getting converted into differential signal at the output. So that is called common mode to differential conversion. So although ideally we should get zero common mode gain, but in presence of mismatches on the two sides, the common mode signal will be converted into differential signal because these two transistors will be having finite mismatch. The gain from one side to the other will be different from the gain from the input to the other side because of that small delta VT or delta W. And hence, there is a common mode to differential conversion. So although this particular typology can be attractive because it is ideally supposed to give us very high common mode rejection ratio for because we have fully differential output, but it is sensitive to mismatch. The moment you are having mismatch in the devices, dimension of the device, threshold voltage of the device, other device parameters, it will translate into poorer CMRR as well as PSRR. So PSRR is another same issue. You are having common VDD noise coming from top or common ground noise coming from the bottom. Once again, these two can propagate through the symmetric paths. If these two paths are perfectly symmetric, if the PMOS transistors and MOS transistors are perfectly matched, the disturbance from the ground and disturbance from the uh, VDD, they will propagate through extremely symmetric path to the output, right? So there is going to be some signal path through which this disturbance is going to propagate to, from the supply sources to the output. But once again, if these two transistors are very well matched, whatever disturbance comes here, these two are going to be perfectly symmetric and hence if we take the difference, it can be cancelled out. So it can give good PSRR as well as compared to the single ended version. So therefore, uh, for biomedical applications, when we are trying to reduce supply voltages, making low power circuits, low voltage circuits, trying to scale down the voltage, for example, rather than using 1.8 volt for 180 nanometer CMOS, we can probably try to go down 1.5, 1.2, just to make the circuit lower power. Because generally, biomedical circuits, the speed requirement is lower. Biomedical signals are having lower bandwidth, 100 hertz at the max kilohertz. So we can sacrifice performance. We can operate them in sub-threshold regions and hence uh, uh, save a lot of power. So whenever we are going for such techniques, reducing the voltages, the supply noise becomes all the more important and we have to choose appropriate topologies. So here, a fully differential topology can help us reduce the overall PSRR and CMRR provided we apply proper layout technique like common centroid layout that you might have uh, covered to match the two sides perfectly and get a neat uh, you know, uh, uh, common mode rejection at the output. And uh, so ideally speaking in this topology, for a fully differential amplifier, the CMRR and the PSRR will be completely governed by the degree of mismatch. If your mismatch is poor, sorry, if your mismatch is high, your CMRR and PSRR both are going to degrade, they're going to become worse. Another advantage of fully differential topology for a given supply voltage you have double the swing available. So uh, once again, uh, visiting the concept of swing, what is the maximum output swing available or what is the maximum input swing available? So that again depends upon the biasing condition and uh, the saturation region operation of the transistors. So if I say that I have biased the input uh, gate voltages of this differential pair to VGI. So this is the DC bias voltage for the input transistors. So under those conditions, what is the minimum output signal that we can have while keeping this transistor in saturation? That is going to be VG minus VT, VGI minus VT. So this drain voltage can go at the max VGI minus VT. Below that, this transistor will be entering into triode region. And likewise for this. For the upper side, once again, if this is VGP, the maximum voltage we can have here is VGP plus mod VTP. Otherwise, the PMOS will be entering into uh, triode region. So the saturation region operation of the NMOS and PMOS transistors govern the boundary, uh, govern the total maximum and minimum swing at the output. So here we have this swing available. 
maximum allowed value VGP plus mod VTP, minimum allowed swing VG uh, I minus VT. And but for the differential case, we have the same this same swing, upper value minus lower value available on both the sides. Whereas for the single ended case, we have only one side swing. So we can say effectively the first case we are having twice the swing available as compared to the second case. So we get double the swing using fully differential topologies. So two major advantages of fully differential scheme is better CMRR, better PSRR and larger swing, double the swing available. Therefore, this is the choice for the main amplifier. We'll be using fully differential scheme for the design of the main amplifier. Uh, as I have uh, said earlier as well, if you're having any uh, query about you know, the page being discussed, please feel free to uh, interrupt. Sorry? Yes, yes. In cadence, you have an option. In the calculator, you can uh, select two voltages and V1, after that, put a negative sign. Uh, there is a subtraction operation as well in the calculator. V1, subtract V2. And then it will plot the differential voltage directly. Next. Uh, another uh, simple uh, argument. Why do we really need the tail current source? Because that is also uh, linked to the CMRR question. So as compared to using a tail current source, what if I just use this uh, two common source amplifier? V i plus and V i minus. This is also acting like a differential amplifier. Here also you can get a V o plus V o minus. You apply a signal here. These are two common source amplifier. V g p, some fixed bias voltage at the gates, some signal, differential signal at the input you can get a corresponding differential signal at the output. So uh, can this act like a differential amplifier? Why do we need the current source? This is a very basic question. I thought uh, we should visit this. So why do we at all need this? So uh, what is the common mode gain in this case? Common mode gain means rather than applying a differential signal, if I tie these two and then apply a common signal, that is a common mode signal, same signal applied to both. So under that condition, what is the condition at the output? Are we getting uh, a good common mode gain or a bad common mode gain? What is the uh, you know signal that we are getting at the output? So both of them are just actually a common source, and the output signals are going to be dependent upon the absolute gate voltage. Both of them are not having any fixed bias current. That is the first disadvantage. So remember, in order to bias the transistor in the appropriate gain region, we discussed that we should have two things fixed. We should have the input bias voltage fixed, the gate voltage should be fixed, and the ID should be fixed. Then we know the bias point. And then we can fluctuate the input signal across the bias point, and we can get a gain across that high gain region. Uh, we can get a swing across that high gain region. So the biasing voltage at the gate and the ID, both of them should be fixed. In this case, of course, we don't have a well-defined bias current. We can take the help of this upper current mirrors to you know, enforce certain bias current. But the lower transistors, the current is strongly dependent upon the input current, uh, uh, upon the uh, input signal. So if the applied input signal is going up or down, the total current, I, B, in both these transistors are going up and down. So currents are not fixed. And hence, we don't have a very stable bias point. And apart from that, as the input signal is going up and down, both the outputs are experiencing a gain of GMRO, GMRO by two in, in, to be exact. And as a result, both of the outputs are having large swing, large common mode swing. That is another disadvantage. Another uh, point is, the gain, gain is not going to be very constant. Gain is dependent upon the input signal itself. The moment input signal goes slightly larger, the GM is going to start depending upon the input signal because the bias current is dependent upon the input signal. And as a result, this is going to be highly 
non-linear, right? As the input voltage changes, the bias current, total current in these two transistors changes. As a result, GM changes. So GM is not constant. GM is signal dependent. And as a result, output is also going to, uh, uh, you know, uh, gain is going to depend upon the input signal itself. So it makes it a very bad differential amplifier. So the use of bias current helps us mitigate all this problem. It provides us high common mode rejection ratio. What is the principle? If we assume that this is a good current source, if we assume there is an ideal current source, ideal current source should have very high output impedance. That means even if this voltage changes, the current should not change. The current should remain fixed. And as a result, if you are applying the common mode signal at both the inputs, we're pulling both these gate voltages up, down, up, down. This current will not change. Source voltage over here, Vs, will follow the input signal exactly if we ignore the channel and modulation for the time being. And as a result, both these branches will keep syncing the current IB by 2 if this is IB because there is no way this total current can change. It is fixed by this bias current. So these two branches will always be syncing the same current IB by 2. And as a result, for an arbitrary load, whatever load we may have here, here I have put a P-MOSFET, you can have any, any arbitrary load, you can have a diode connected device, you can have a passive resistor. So as long as these two currents are exactly IB by 2, you are always going to get the same DC point, VDD minus IB by 2 RD, where RD is the effective load resistance. And hence, we can say that it is going to reject the common mode signal much more strongly. And that basic property of common mode rejection comes from the bias current. If you don't have this bias current, you don't have common mode rejection. Now, we will see uh, in the overall design, this current mirror plays an important role. So when we discuss design of different transistors, sizing of different transistors for the overall amplifier, once again, the tail current transistor becomes crucial. And how to implement the current source? The easiest way is uh, a current mirror where you have a reference current coming. So you have an I ref, which is a well-controlled, precise reference current generated on the chip. So there are certain ways uh, through which we can generate very precise, fairly precise to be uh, more correct, fairly precise temperature depend independent and VDD independent current source. So we can have a precise current source located at one point in the chip and we can, using a diode connected transistor, we can produce a reference voltage VG N and then keep applying this VG N to the other transistors. And if these two transistors, they are, uh, they are close together, they are well matched, they are having same VGS. So we can expect that the current in these two transistors will be almost similar. Of course, there is channel length modulation that comes into picture. But if we ignore the channel length modulation, we can say that this is going to uh, mirror the IRF flowing into this transistor, provided W by L is same. If you scale W by L, you can get the corresponding scaling in the IRF. So that is the basic principle of current mirror, and we can use this branch as the current source. So this is the current source that can be used over here. What is the output impedance of this current source? If I say that, what is the output impedance looking into this current source? What is it? Once again, it is the impedance looking into the drain of the N MOSFET with gate voltage fixed. And therefore, it is RO. So for the simple current mirror, the impedance is RO. We can do something like this to have a so we can do something like this and use this part as the current source. What is output impedance of this? So here also we have the same functionality. We are having a reference current generated on the chip we are injecting it into this branch, which is a combination of a stack of two di diode connected N MOSFETs. So we are going to produce reference voltages VG N1, VG N2 for this N MOSFET, which is again applied to the gates of the other N MOSFET on the other side. And then this, this is thinking we are, uh, we can expect that this is going to mirror the same current I ref. Now what is the output impedance of the output of this branch? Yesterday we have done that. Approximately GMRO square. We have impedance looking into the drain of the MOSFET RO. 
impedance looking into the drain of the MOSFET with a source resistance RO, GM RO square. And as a result, the cascode, this is called cascode current source, which can provide much higher output resistance. That means the current of a cascode current source is going to be much more stable. Even if this voltage changes significantly, the current remains much more flatter, much more constant. And hence, it can provide much larger CMRR or it can improve your CMRR because CMRR or common mode rejection ratio depends upon this current. Current. If this current is constant, if it is stable, the more constant it is, the more stable it is, the better is the common mode rejection ratio or lower is the common mode gain. Because as long as this current is ideal, as long as it is almost constant, independent of the voltage changes over here, these two voltages are not going to change for the applied common mode voltage. So that is the key behind improving common mode ratio, common mode uh, rejection ratio by applying a cascode current source. Of course, we will see that swing requirement goes up. Two MOSFET transistors, they will require larger drain to source voltage. So if this transistor requires a VDS drop to operate in saturation region, here we have twice of that. So that is, of course, the disadvantage. We will see that can affect the overall swing, input swing. Poles, uh, the way pole is calculated here and here is very, very different. Uh, for the two, uh, for the, the first case, we have high impedance node coming only at the two points here and here. So the uh, first case, the high impedance nodes, impedance, uh, they are only over here, the drain points. In the second case, we have a high impedance node only at one point over here. So they are, the critical pole over here is going to be at the output. Again, if you are ignoring the input resistance driver of the source, so this is the critical point. Whereas in the second case, both the outputs are having poles. Yeah, here, what is the impedance of this? This is one upon GM, which yeah. can be significantly lower than RO, okay. provided your bias current is sufficient. If you keep your bias current too low, then one upon GM can also go high. Yeah, that pole has to be neglected or what actually? Yeah, generally we can, we can ignore it. Even when we go to the two-stage amplifier, uh, we will see that we can generally ignore this pole uh, in the overall analysis. It happens to be significantly higher. Now, uh, next we proceed towards the two-stage. Fully differential amplifier, which is the core of our front-end amplifier. So we are adding a cas another stage, we are cascading another stage, which is just a common source amplifier, two different common source amplifier cascaded after the first differential pair. And we are taking the outputs over here. These are all connected together. We can have the same bias voltage VG uh, N for all the current sources. So these three, these two branches, they are just like common source amplifier with PMOS as the input device. So the first stage is supposed to be having some bias voltage for the PMOS transistor. As we have seen yesterday, uh, one of the technique to do that is common mode feedback. So for an applied signal, at the input, we are going to get differential signal at the output of the first stage, and that is going to the input of the second stage, which is once again going to give you another set of inversion. And hence, our final output is at these two points, VO plus and VO minus. So this is just a common source amplifier with active load constituted by this NMOS transistor. So if I call the GM of first two transistors, as GM1 and the second stage GM of these two transistors, GM2, I can write down my overall gain for this amplifier as GM1 R1, where R1 is the overall impedance looking at this stage. So at any particular point, uh, if I have to talk about the gain of fully differential amplifier, I can look at the differential operation, I can make this AC ground, then I am left with Basically, just two common source amplifier. First with NMOS as the input, 
and the output of that common source amplifier going to the second stage, which is again a common source amplifier with PMOS at the input. So once again, we have the gain of the first stage as GM1 times RO by 2. Second stage, once again, you have a gain of GM2 times RO by 2. If I assume the RO of all the MOSFETs are same, because at the output, what we have seen, the overall impedance is RO up, RO down. RO up is RO P, RO down, again RO N. Therefore, GM1 RO by 2, second stage, once again, GM1 RO by 2. And uh, if we take the differential signal, we get twice of that. In that case, it becomes G overall gain becomes of the order of GM RO by 2. So, uh, we have overall gain of this uh, stage GM RO square by 2. So, once again, we are having the same order GM RO the whole square, the same we get uh, got from the cascading of two common source amplifier or by using a single stage cascode amplifier. So, it can give us high gain that is required to build a uh, operational amplifier. Now, the next point is the DC biasing, the DC biasing of the input, output, that is the first step in designing the amplifier. And towards that end, we have discussed uh, the concept of common mode feedback yesterday. Now, how to implement that concept over here? So, here we have high impedance node at both the stages. So, at the first stage also we have active load, second stage also we have active load. We are fixing the bias current IB, in this case, IB dash, IB dash. So, uh, assume that in the first stage you have a bias current IB, second stage you have a bias current IB dash. Each of these, this might be coming from a current mirror or a current source that we just discussed, right? So, so you are being uh, provided a bias voltage for the gate of these three current sources by a reference branch. Now, each, uh, uh, both the stages have a high impedance output. Both of them have active load. Therefore, their DC conditions are not well defined. So, we need to fix the DC bias at both the stages using common mode feedback. So, one option is that we try to set the common mode only for the output stage by giving a feedback to the first stage. And through that, we expect that the first stage common mode will also be automatically adjusted. That is one way of doing it. Second option may be, which can be a better option, more safe, uh, a safer option. We can use separate common mode feedback for both the stages individually. That is a safer option. It can ensure that both of them are set to required common mode voltages without uh, relying on certain assumptions. Now, uh, we have seen yesterday, you know, possible ways of uh, getting the common mode signal out. So, first of all, we need a, you know, uh, common mode signal extracted. So, we yesterday, we saw that it can be possibly done by using a resistor, right, resistive divider. So, this node voltage is going to be VO1 plus VO2 by 2, therefore, it automatically gives you the common mode voltage, the mean of the two differential voltages, VO1 plus VO2 by 2. But we saw what is the disadvantage of using this resistor? It can reduce your gain because this becomes, an, for a differential mode, this becomes an AC ground and as a result, you are going to have this resistor coming in parallel with the RO and hence lower your gain. So, rather than that, we can take advantage of active uh, common mode feedback circuits, which can uh, uh, develop the common mode voltage of the uh, amplifier without the use of additional resistors. So, suppose I am taking V O plus over here and V O minus over here. So, V O plus I have connected at this point, V O minus I have connected at this point. Uh, other side we have a V C M ref, that is the reference common mode voltage, the target common mode voltage that we want to achieve at the output point. And we are Suppose uh, we are having a uh, 
direct connected load over here. So this is once again the differential amplifier with current mirror load where you have a diode connection. We are going to make use of this to develop the common mode voltage for the first one. So we know that this guy, it already has its common mode voltage. It does not need a common mode feedback to develop its common mode voltage because whenever we have this diode connected device present, it generates the common mode voltage. It is having it, uh, you know, a force bias current IB. So depending upon the uh, bias current, it will generate its own VSG and hence under DC condition, under common mode condition, these two voltages will be fixed depending upon the VSG of this MOSFET. So this does not need a separate common mode feedback. So therefore, we are going to take help of this guy to get the common mode feedback for first one. The first one, we, are, we have chosen the first one for our design because it is fully differential, better CMRR, better PSRR and all. But we are taking the help of the second one just to get a better biasing for the first guy. Now, if this is W, we can choose W by 2 for each of these transistors. What happens in that case to the GM? So, since this is W by 2 each, and if uh, VO plus, VO minus, if we assume that both of them have tied together to VCM ref, under that condition, each of these transistors will be syncing IB by 4, this side IB by 2. Therefore, the GM of these two transistors proportional to root under ID W by L is going to be half the GM of this transistor. So if this is GM, each of this is going to be GM by 2. And hence, total GM is going to be GM on this side as well. So we have GM, GM, equivalent GM of these two transistors, just the GM. And then, if we want to write the small signal current, now if suppose VO plus and VO minus are changing, so I can write down the small signal current flowing through this branch as GM 1 by 2 times VO plus, or call it GM, if GM is the GM of the left hand, uh, right hand side device, I can write down the small signal current, total small signal current in this branch as GM by 2 VO plus plus GM by 2 VO minus, which is just like taking the common mode voltage. And on the right hand side, we have minus GM times VCM ref. So this translates to GM times the VCM, actual VCM minus VCM ref. This is what we want. We want an error amplifier where we are having two differential inputs. One of them is the actual VCM and other one is the reference VCM. So this branch is helping us generate the VCM signal without having any resistive division. And then we are comparing it with the common mode reference. And uh, the final output is being taken at this point. So this is acting like a single stage error amplifier where the overall gain can be written as GM RO by 2. So if I just forget that these two transistors are different, we can just tie them together and then look at this as, as if I have applied the actual VCM at one of the input and we have the reference VCM at the other input. Then it becomes just like a differential amplifier and we are just going to get GM RO signal at the output. So we are having a relatively high gain coming at the output point. Now what happens if I again do the thought experiment? What happens if the common mode signal of the amplifier increases? So, if the common mode of, of the amplifier is, say, going up. Is it connected to the same load or what is that? Here you are connected to different loads uh, in this case. Yes. In the second circuit. Yes. The differential pair, the drain is connected to the same load or in the second circuit? No. Uh, so, I have not, this is, uh, so far I am treating it as a separate circuit. Only thing is the output of the first stage, VO plus and VO minus is coming to the input of this stage. Okay. So right now I have not made any connection bet between the output of the first stage and the input. So I am going to do that where the output of this amplifier is going to go, we are going to decide that. Now again, uh, we need to do the thought experiment that what happens if the uh, common mode voltage goes up. 
So suppose common mode voltage is going up, that means VO plus plus VO minus by 2 is going up. That can happen, suppose, if the two PMOS transistors over here, their threshold voltage is getting lowered. As a result, they start sinking large, uh, supplying larger current, and this VO plus VO minus starts going up. That is, a common mode signal is going up, both of them together. So that means, what is going to go uh, happen to the output? This is going to go down because the common mode signal is coming here. So the common mode signal goes up. This means this output goes down. And as a result, if I now feed this signal to the first stage PMOS load, what is it going to do? It is going to increase the current of the PMOS device, right? So the common mode vo voltage is going up. As a result, this voltage, the output of the error amplifier that is going down, that means the PMOS current in the first stage, that is going up. That means the output of the first stage, both of it will slide up. And if the output of the first stage goes up, the current in these two PMOS transistors goes down. And once again, the output goes back down. So once again, you are having a negative loop established. And it can help you stabilize the output common mode voltage. So by controlling the bias voltage of the first stage PMOS transistor, we are able to control the output common mode voltage of the second stage. That is the final actual target common mode output of the amplifier. Right? We can, as I said, we can do it individually for both the stages as well. We can apply such a common mode feedback circuit to the first stage as well as second stage separately and hence bias them to desired common mode voltages. That is a safer option because in this case we are relying on the common mode voltage developed of at the first stage to control the common mode voltage of the second stage. So if it goes out of range, it can create issues. So safer option would be if you are designing this circuit for more robustness, we can design this common mode feedback circuit individually for both the stages, the input stage and the second stage. Any questions regarding this? Generally, common mode reference will be decided to, in order to maximize the output swing, right? We want maximum possible input swing and ma maximum possible output swing. So, so in order to have maximum possible output swing, the uh, ballpark value will be VDD by 2. We can just keep it VDD by 2 so that on the upper side as well as on the lower side, we have symmetric swing, maximum symmetric swing available. Now. Yesterday, we discussed the concept of stability. Now, here we have a feedback system. And whenever we have a closed loop feedback, we need to look at stability, the phase margin, gain margin, and make sure that the system is going to be stable. So once again, we have a closed loop feedback. And therefore, we need to analyze the stability of this system. And uh, to do that, we need to look at the open loop gain, the loop gain which is A beta. So uh, in this case, in order to get the loop gain, the first thing we have to do is we have to break the feedback. So if you are having a, any arbitrary feedback loop, you have A beta. So in order to get the overall loop gain, we can break the loop over here and then apply the input at this point, look at the final output after beta. Or we can also break the loop over here and uh, keep this connected, apply the input at this point, look at the output over here. So any of the strategy can be used. Yes? Sir, left hand uh, bottom corner, the transistor should not be uh, diode connected? No. This is a current source transistor. So this is just sourcing. It is providing a bias value. The left, left hand bottom corner. Left hand bottom. This is the left hand bottom. I don't no, have any other left hand bottom. Yes, yes. This one. It should not yeah. be diode connected? No. Okay. This is current source. So it, this is the diode connected transistor. Oh. So this is providing you a reference voltage. And it is get, there are topologies in which if you are using, say, 
uh, in, in case you are using uh, single ended output, then you can use a direct connected transistor over here. In that case, the output will be only here. It, the signal will be taken as a single ended version. So that case basically, uh, that's a different topology. Let's not discuss that. Now here, likewise, we can easily, uh, so here, if we want to break the loop, we can do it at any point and just trace the loop to find the overall gain. So suppose one of the easy points to break the loop can be this. So we disconnect the output of the first stage from the input of the second stage. And then we just have two amplifiers in chain. The f we have the first amplifier, this becomes the first amplifier. If we, we can apply a certain input at the first point and then trace what is the final output coming at the output of the first stage. That is going to give me the total loop gain, A beta. So starting from this point, if I apply a signal, how much signal is coming at the drain of the first stage and then it is going back to the PMOS and tracing back once again second stage, what is the final signal reaching over here? That is going to give us the loop gain. So how do we determine the loop gain for an applied common mode signal for an applied signal at the first stage. So let us see how to do that. So before we uh, make a fresh drawing, for the, uh, for the second uh, amplifier over here, we are applying the uh, test signal. Tying both these gates together, we are applying a test signal and generating an output over here, which is going back to the first amplifier. So here we have a differential amplifier operation. The first one is a common mode reference. Gate of these two transistors are being tied to an applied signal. So this is still a differential amplifier for us. Whereas in the second stage, we are feeding a signal over here at the midpoint. Actually, AC signals, they are set to zero. So we don't have any AC signal applied to the actual input. We only have an input coming to this point. Therefore, now, for this amplifier, this becomes the input device. And both the input devices, they are receiving the same signal. Therefore, it is a common mode operation, considering this as the input device now. So for the loop gain analysis, the PMOS becomes the input device, and we are having common mode operation for the first stage over here. So we can make the common mode half circuit corresponding to the first stage. We don't really need to bother about the both the outputs together. We just need to treat half the circuit and look at the common mode half circuit to find the output signal at this point. Let us see how to do that. So the common mode half circuit, as we have seen, we need to retain the current source transistor as well because this is not an AC ground. For the common mode half circuit, the concept is that as long as the circuits are symmetrical, both the node voltages are going to change by the same amount. The same signal over here and here, same signal over here and here. Therefore, we can just short these two points. Short these two points and short these two points and generate a single ended version. So let us uh, do that. So this is uh, say V in, which is anyway uh, AC ground. So we have established an AC ground over here, no input signal applied. And likewise, you have here also an AC ground. Now the output of this stage goes to the second stage. All are AC ground. This is also a current source, so there is no AC signal over here, so I put an AC ground. This is receiving the signal from the first stage. For the other side, if I have to replicate the feedback amplifier, so this is just acting like a direct connected differential amplifier uh, with a current mirror load. So you are applying an input signal over here. This is VCM ref. And then you have another current source, which is AC ground. 
output of this stage is being fed back to the first stage. So we have to basically find out the gain between the input point over here and the output point over here for this circuit. So that is going to give us the loop gain. Now, for the first circuit, once again, we know this is a differential pair and therefore the overall gain is simply going to be GMRO. So you have the gain from the input to the output as GMRO. For the first stage, there is no problem, of course, with a negative sign. Next, we have to find out the gain from here to here. How do we do that? So first of all, this is a common source amplifier with PMOS as the input device. And therefore, I just need to see what is the load. What is the load looking downward? So if I, if I can find out what is the R down, then it is just a PMOS common source amplifier with R down as the load or the load impedance. So then GM times R down becomes the gain. So what is R down? Just, uh, uh, we have uh, done it very in the very beginning today. Two MOS transistors, gate voltage, AC ground stacked together. What is the small signal impedance looking into the drain? GMRO square. So once again, we have, uh, so I can write it as GMP and this is uh, GMN. So we have GMP and GMRO square. So I am just going to write the order, total order. So here we have the gain of this stage given by say GMP times GMN RO N square. And once again, negative sign. And finally, we have once again a common source amplifier, gain given by GMP RO P parallel RO N, or you can just write it down as RO by 2. And once again, a negative sign. So overall, we have a uh, negative sign and this is the magnitude of the gain. So this is how we can find out the overall A beta or loop gain A beta. Now in order to do compensation what we have seen is for the closed loop uh, for the open loop amplifier we need to find out the critical poles the nodes at which we are going to get uh, uh, high frequency poles. Now in this circuit what are the critical nodes what are the high impedance nodes which are going to give us poles? So wherever we have drain of NMOS and PMOS connected together, that is going to give you a high impedance node. At that node, the total impedance is going to be ROP parallel RON. So here, this is a differential amplifier. For differential operation, I can treat this as an AC ground. Impedance looking downward, RON. Impedance looking upward, ROP. And hence, we have a total impedance over here, RO by 2, high impedance node. Likewise, once again here, I'm sorry, uh, I did a mistake here and that is, I did not account for the RO of P while writing the gain, if you notice. So the total gain for a common source amplifier, we ne always need to consider ZL parallel RO of the MOSFET also. So GM times ZL parallel RO. If ZL is much smaller than RO, then you can ignore it. Otherwise, it always has to be GM times ZL parallel RO. So here I have not included RO of the MOSFET itself. So RO parallel with GM RO square is approximately equal to RO because GM RO is much larger than 1. So here actually the gain will not be GM RO square times GMP. It will be just GMP times RO. Is this clear? What was the issue? And now uh, we are talking about the high frequency poles. So first high impedance noted at this point because we have a PMOS and MOS drain connected together. Second high impedance point over here, once again PMOS and MOS drain connected together. Impedance looking downward is very high, GMRO square. That looking upward is relatively low, but again RO, again high impedance node. And finally, once again at the output, you have another high impedance node, ROP parallel RON. So all these three points are going to contribute to our poles. So we are getting three poles, three high impedance nodes, and hence three poles in this circuit. So for a three pole system, the overall gain equation from input to output, as we have seen yesterday, can be written as one plus 
एस अपॉन पी वन वन प्लस एस अपॉन पी टू वन प्लस एस अपॉन पी थ्री वेयर पी वन पी टू पी थ्री कॉरस्पॉन्ड टू द पोल्स एट द थ्री पॉइंट से कॉल इट एक्स वाई एंड जेड so the poles are determined by 1 upon r equivalent 1 upon r 3 c 3 where r equivalent is the small signal resistance at that node given by r r o m parallel r o p and c 3 is the overall parasitic capacitance each of this mosfet is going to have their parasitic capacitances and we can find out the overall parasitic capacitance between each node and ground effective overall parasitic capacitance between each node and ground i'm not going to go into detail but i hope you know uh, uh, most of us can do that so at each node we have high impedance r at each node is high c at each node is going to be comparable more or less we are going to get uh, relatively you know uh, significant poles at all these three nodes now the concept that we have seen yesterday for compensating we need to make sure that the first pole is brought down such that the second pole is beyond the zero crossing point of the gain so we need to insert a dominant pole so compensation generally involves making one of the poles dominant so that the uh, zero crossing point is falling above the second and third pole that was the condition we reached yesterday so we can make any of these three poles dominant by inserting an additional large capacitor so that capacitance at that node becomes significantly higher than that of other nodes so where exactly we can put that capacitor so we want to make one of these nodes at x y or z higher uh, you know uh, the total capacitance we want to boost up just add an additional passive capacitance so that the pole becomes lower significantly lower and hence we achieve the phase margin so which node is the best suitable should we add it over here what is, any problem if we add it over here this is the main amplifier which is processing your desired signal i don't want to mess up with that if you add capacitance here or here it is going to lower the bandwidth of the main amplifier right rather than that i would do something with this this is not required to process the actual signal this is being used just to provide a dc bias point right so it is only going to operate in dc it is not receive it is not supposed to you know give you very fast response it is just for dc biasing common mode signal may change common mode of the first stage may change but generally we expect that the common mode change can be slow significantly slower than the Uh, differential input and as a result the speed requirement from the second stage is really low we don't really want high speed from here so as compared to the first case first stage we can sacrifice the speed of the second stage whenever you add capacitor it lowers the pole that means it of course slows down the circuit so i can put a compensation capacitor cc over here and hence make the pole at the node x much lower as compared to the pole at the other two nodes and hence achieve my condition that before p3 and p2 uh, p2 and p3 arrive my overall loop gain has already fallen down with 20 db per decade slope so accordingly i can find out what is the cc required to achieve that i know the p3 location from the circuit i can calculate what is p3 and hence i can find out what is the additional c required to uh push the p1 below uh, certain value now another uh possibility is to use mirror multiplication let us not do it here uh let us do it for the main amplifier so here the compensation is clear so we will be applying the similar technique for compensating the actual feedback for the signal so this feedback is only for the dc biasing which is relatively low frequency feedback now of course we are designing an op amp the main circuit that we are designing over here this is the main amplifier right now we are just looking at the open loop condition ultimately we have to design a feedback amplifier based on this right so the purpose of designing a very high gain differential amplifier is to finally use it in a feedback loop and the feedback provides us a well defined gain so if you have a feedback amplifier constituted of op amp r1 r2 connected in feedback we know what is the gain minus r2 by r1 
So feedback gives us the possibility of having well controlled gain just divided decided by the ratio of the passive elements. Just by deciding the ratio of R1 and R2, we can have a very well defined, very well controlled gain. Whereas in the open loop amplifier, we have very high gains, but they are not very well controlled. Each of these parameters, GM, RO, etc., they can vary a lot over temperature, over process, for the same device, for the same chip, it can vary over time. So they are not very well controlled quantities. Whereas ratio of two passive elements like R1, R2, even if they can vary with temperature, but the ratio remains more or less very well controlled. And as a result, we use feedback amplifiers. We use these high gain amplifiers in feedback loop. Just make sure that the overall gain, open loop gain is high enough. And in that case, we can uh, achieve a total gain of, you know, if the overall gain is A and your feedback factor is beta, we know for the negative feedback amplifier is going to be A upon 1 plus A beta. And if A beta is much, much greater than 1, which is generally true, we get the overall gain as 1 upon beta, which is the feedback factor uh, determined by the passive element. So that is the purpose we are going to have. We are going to use, we are first of all going to design this high gain open loop amplifier and then use it in feedback configuration. Once again, there we need to analyze the feedback loop once again, look at the stability of the main amplifier for the overall operation. Now let us see, now we have, uh, we are done with the uh, common mode biasing of the output as well as the output of the first stage, both of them have been taken care of. We have not yet talked about the DC biasing of the input, we will come to it. So that is again related to feedback. So let us first see uh, in the same flow how to look at the feedback of the uh, main amplifier if you want to analyze the feedback operation of the main amplifier. So that is uh, critical for the stability of the main signal uh, amplification path. So now if I once again uh, if I wish to use this circuit as a differential, fully differential amplifier. So these are the positive and negative input terminals and corresponding negative and positive output terminals. So we all are familiar with of course the negative feedback amplifier. So here we know what is the output or input relationship VO upon V in is minus R2 by R1. Likewise, we can have the corresponding fully differential version of this. R2, R1. And here, if I talk about the VO plus or V out upon V in differential, here also we have the same relationship V out upon V in is going to be equal to minus R2 upon R1. Only difference is we are taking the output also differentially as well as the input. So V out upon V in differential is minus R2 upon R1 in this example, in this particular feedback configuration. So this is the configuration we are going to use. We are going to use some impedances, not necessarily resistance. We will see that uh, resistance is not a good option. So we need this feedback. Uh, you know, a circuit for achieving a desired gain minus R2 by R1. In the specs that we derived yesterday, we targeted a gain of around 30 to 40 for the first stage. So this Z2 upon Z1 is going to be around 30 to 40. That is the target value. And as long as the A is sufficiently large, maybe 1000, which is good enough. So for the time being arbitrary, we can set the desired value of A to be 1000, which is achievable, easily achievable in the two stage amplifier. Now, how do we analyze the stability of the feedback over here? So let us uh, look at the single ended version. It is easier to follow. So if we just look at the single ended version, first of all, we need to find out what is A and beta in this circuit. So how to determine A and beta? So in, that is the close the, the open loop gain. Suppose this is Z2, this is Z1, applied input signal over here. Now 
Now, what is the uh, feedback configuration used? So, what kind of feedback configuration is it? We have four basic feedback configuration, series, 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 shunt, shunt, series, shunt, shunt. So, which feedback configuration are we using here? Most So what are we sensing at the output? Voltage and what are we mixing? Current. So it's a voltage current because here whenever we are having the same branch receiving the input as well as feedback, it has to be shunt connection. It has to be current mixing because you can mix two currents by just connecting them to the same node, right? So this is a current mixing. You are feeding a feedback current to the input current. So in order to vi better visualize it, we can transform the input source into a current source by thevening equivalent. So, that becomes Z in and we have the impedance looking into the input node approximately if I assume that this is a high gain amplifier, this is a virtual ground. So, it is just Z1 and uh, Z1 upon V in gives us the input current source. So, now we can replace this by the Thevenin equivalent and again construct this feedback loop. Now, we are sensing the output voltage and feeding back current. What is the feedback factor then? Just V out upon Z2. So, the feedback factor is the feedback current IF, IF upon V out. It gives us the beta and that is just 1 upon Z2. So now, in order to find out the overall gain in this system. First, we need to decide what are these feedback elements and based on that, we need to see how to uh, do the stability analysis for this. So, before we go into the closed loop analysis and stability analysis of this feedback system, let us talk about the Z1 and Z2. What should be the choice of Z1 and Z2? Whether capacitors are good enough or we need something different. So, that once again comes from the specs that we defined yesterday. So, we had defined certain specs for the electrode and the main uh, key point from there was the electrode is offering a large impedance, especially if we talk about dry electrode having an impedance of around mega ohm or higher and that mandates us to have very high input impedance for the main amplifier. As you see, if we have a feedback configuration like this, the input impedance of the main amplifier is going to be just Z1 approximately because this is an AC ground, input impedance looking into this terminal is just going to be Z1. So, that means the first impedance over here has to be very large, larger than mega ohm, so around 10 mega ohm and then if we want to get a gain of 50, we need a 500 mega ohm over here. So, very large value of resistors required which is not very practical on chip integration if you want to do with such very uh, such large resistor value, they are going to have very large amount of mismatch and the values will not be very accurate. There are ways in which we can do it, but it will take a lot of area, mismatch will be very bad and uh, uh, there can be noise considerations as well. So, having such large value of resistors to control the gain is not a good option. Therefore, we need to take alternate method, we can we need to go for capacitors. So, we can use capacitive feedback rather. So, once again this requirement is coming from the actual design uh, conditions. So, we can now use capacitive feedback say C1, C2 and the gain becomes minus C2 upon C1. So, we can just say gain is going to be Z2 or uh, let me just be consistent right it is C2 and C1. So, this is Z2 upon Z1. So, the ratios will be just inverted. So, we, we get C1 upon C2 omega C1 upon omega C2, omega gets cancelled and therefore, you have overall gain given by minus C1 upon C2. Now, suppose we have uh, these capacitances, uh, we can possibly talk about their values uh, little later, what how to calculate the required values we can uh, try to find out little later. Before that, once we have decided that this is these are the elements being used, 
Let us see uh, how to proceed with the stability analysis. So for the stability analysis, once again, our target is to find out the A beta. So for A beta, we have the feedback uh, element given as C2. So C1 once again can be absorbed as the source impedance. We can just treat this as a part of the source. Our main feedback network is over here, constituted by C2. Now, in order to find out the overall uh, uh, loop gain, we need to break the feedback. And in order to break the feedback, we need to take into account the loading effect of the feedback network. Those of you who are not aware, I'm just going to say some rules. We can you know, uh, try to describe that in the additional notes that will be sent or in the video. I, we can edit it later and add the more details. But whenever we are fade, uh, uh, breaking a shunt connectivity, you are having input current coming here. You have a ZF as a feedback element. and we are trying to break this feedback network, we need to take into account the loading effect of the feedback network. So the rule is that if it is a shunt shunt connection, it is a shunt connection at the output and it is a shunt connection at the input. So the shunt shunt connectivity, while breaking the loop in order to take into account the loading effect of the feedback network, we need to look into the feedback network from the output side and the other end needs to be grounded. So I look into the feedback network, ground the other end, and place that impedance at the output. That captures the loading effect of the shunt shunt feedback network at the output. Likewise, at the input side, once again, I will be looking into the feedback network, ground the other end. Other end is also shunt. So I will once again looking into the feedback network, ground the other end, and place that impedance at the input point. That gives us, or that captures the loading effect of the feedback network, of the shunt shunt feedback network at the input. So this is now the open loop amplifier, considering the loading effect of the feedback network. In the earlier case, you remember the loading was completely, the uh, connection was all capacitive. The output of the first stage was going to the input of the second stage, so the, the loading device was a capacitor. It was not having any impedance or uh, resistive connectivity. So there we did not really consider the loading effect. It was not required. Here we are having a resistive feedback. Now, need, consider, uh, considering the loading effect, this is the effective open loop amplifier that we have arrived at. From here, we need to calculate the loop gain A beta and from there do the stability analysis. So. Now what will be the A beta? So A beta will be V out upon I in, because now the input current, uh, input signal is a current. So first we need to convert this I in into a voltage over here, because this is an amplifier, voltage to voltage amplifier. Only thing is we are using it as a current input. So I in times ZF gives us the V in for this amplifier. That times A O, where A O is the open loop gain of this amplifier, gives us the output voltage. And that is going to be my uh, output signal over here. But now, once again, the A of this amplifier is the open loop gain without this ZF. We need to include the effect of this ZF in the open loop amplifier gain as well. So in this case, we know ZF. ZF is just going to be 1 upon SC. So In the two-stage amplifier, we know what is the overall gain. Gm1 times R1 multiplied by Gm2 times R2, where R1 and R2 are the impedances of the first and second stage. But now it is going to be R2 parallel Zf. Second stage gain is modified, R2 parallel Zf, because we are having the loading effect of the uh, feedback network. And therefore, now let us see. This is going to be my final output voltage. I have accounted for the loading effect of the feedback network on the main amplifier in order to calculate the overall loop gain. So that is GM1R1, GM1, GM2R2 was the 
initial gain, but now R2 has been modified. It has a parallel component ZF coming in. And what is that ZF? ZF is 1 upon SC, or to be uh, more accurate, SC2, the feedback capacitor. So I can write this down, 1 upon SC2, GM1, R1, GM2, R2 into 1 upon SC, 2 upon 1 upon 1 plus SC, R2 plus 1 upon SC2. Now in the frequency range of interest, what should be the C2 value? That is also needed to find out. Now the gain is C1 upon C2. We know the ratio, ratio around 30 to 40, that is the target value we want to have. C2 has to be lower. So we can choose appropriate value for C2. Now, uh, the uh, most important concern is that C2 should be sufficiently higher than the parasitic capacitances of the MOSFET, so that the overall gain is well defined by only the feedback capacitor. Remember that each of the MOSFETs also, they also have their parasitic capacitances. Sir, uh, just one question, sorry to interrupt. Yes. Uh, when we are considering capacitive load in the feedback loop, yes. are we consider we are not considering Miller effect of that? Miller the capacitor said the input and output because you have taken same as uh, at the input side and output side. No, here we are talking about the loading effect. That concept is completely yes. different. So if you are having an impedance in the feedback loop and you are trying to look at the loading effect, that if you open that loop, what is the equivalent impedance the two points are going to feel? So but that while, is yeah. uh, that is different as compared to finding out the equivalent impedances that uh, you know. So uh, uh, I can try to you know provide a proof for this uh, discussion separately. So there, uh, I guess, if you're talking about the feedback path, uh, so so there we are uh, mainly going to look at the uh, you know the effect of the output signal on the input signal and that is given by the passive network R itself. So uh, I can try to you know justify this how is it different from Miller effect and try to it will take uh, you know a good amount of uh, discussion to show that. Okay sir. Now if I go back and talk about the values of C1 and C2 that we can choose. So C2 uh, needs to be significantly larger than the parasitic capacitances of the main amplifier. So here, each of these transistors, they can have their own parasitic capacitances. For nominal values, if you are having, say, in the 180 nanometer CMOS technology, you are having overall uh, dove loose of, say, 20 to 20 micrometer, total parasitic capacitance at least can be around tens femtofarad, few tens of femtofarad. So at least an order of magnitude higher than that. So the total uh, capacitance, the capacitance value C1, C2 must be at least an order of magnitude higher than the parasitic capacitances. So if I am having a parasitic capacitance at the output node of around 10 femtofarad, I can try to keep C2 at least 100 femtofarad or higher. So this gives me the lower limit so that my the gain ratio is not corrupted by the parasitic capacitances of the MOSFET. It is mainly defined by the C1, C2 ratio. And then if I need a gain of 50, I can keep a 5 picofarad capacitance over here. So uh, I will continue the discussion on stability. I have just chosen the value of capacitor and I will be using this to find out the stability conditions and all. Uh, so we can have a 5 minute break. <laughs>